Meat eaters beware, your favourite protein supply is in short supply and getting shorter. Scientists predict by 2050 most humans will have to eat a vegetarian diet. Genetically modified foods might help, but are consumers ready to eat food grown in a lab rather than in a field? I'm Martin Stanford. This is Inside. Welcome to Insight. An increase in global population, climate change and threats from new diseases are set to shake up the world's meat industry. As intensive meat and fish production methods become less tenable, vegetable and insect-based protein alternatives are becoming increasingly common. On top of this, vegetarian and vegan diets are more and more popular in the Western world. One in eight UK consumers consider themselves vegetarian. What then? for the future of meat. Insight's Dana Lewis reports. By the year 2056, another 2.5 billion people are coming to dinner. According to UN estimates, the Earth's population will equal 10 billion people. And the question is, what are we going to eat? There's just no way we can meet the global demands for meat. So we have to do something. And there's, there's a number of alternatives. You know, there are, there's obviously plant-based products. Barry Honeycomb is the owner of More Than Meat, a small and growing business run out of his home kitchen in South London. Tell me what this is now. So this is a vegan sausage roll. Mm -hmm. It's made with a vegan puff pastry, and then it's filled with um, uh, a sausage meat that's made from uh, um, a vital wheat gluten as the base. It has oats and chickpea flour, and then it's flavored with smoked yeah, apple. It. Yeah, of course. And the taste? You have to try meat substitutes yourself to appreciate them. They are definitely a healthy alternative. Barry has sausage substitutes and others, labeled more than hamburgers, more than lamb casseroles, more than meat, he says, because... Our burgers, for example, are 90 grams, and they contain 21 grams of protein, which is actually more protein than you would get in a beef burger, so you've got higher protein. In the UK alone, vegan food sales are up 1,500% in 2016. Things like smoky bacon substitutes and salami substitutes. And it's just not vegans and vegetarians versus meat eaters, but the real growth in the market is so-called flexitarians, people who may eat meat but for health reasons want to cut down their consumption. At London's Borough Market, the local meat butcher is still carving up his steaks and ribs like he always has. But individual customers cite health concerns such as diabetes, heart disease, and even cancer linked to red meat. This man says, like many other people, he has cut down the amount of meat he eats. Maybe two meals, two meat meals a week, um, at most. But globally, the world has a supersized meat and poultry appetite. Consumption is on the rise especially as Asia switches from mostly grain diets to more beef. Meat production has tripled over the last 40 years, an increase by 20% in the last decade. Meat and poultry farming are blamed for pollution. Animal waste can and does contaminate rivers and streams. There are wild and varied estimates on how much greenhouse gas is produced by domestic animal waste. But the consensus is the damage to the environment is significant. And many animals are fed antibiotics contributing resistance to disease in animals and humans alike. There are so-called free-range sustainable farms, but most farms are factories. As witnessed recently in an Intelligence Squared debate in London, the argument over eating meat and poultry versus a vegetarian diet goes something like this. The disproportion between that little bit of extra pleasure you might get from eating meat and the phenomenal amount of destruction required to produce it should surely commend it to anyone as a stupid thing to do. Everything is part of nature. Everything has the right to be part of it. But everything dies in it and everything gets eaten. Everything gets eaten. Mm. Everything dies. I'm the meat man, baby. In the 70s, Jerry Lee Lewis was singing about being a meat man who gets his fill with jaws like a bear and teeth like a raisin. But these days, there is a softer song being sung by people like Paul McCartney. His late wife, Linda, founded a profitable vegetarian food business, and he's carried on campaigning for less meat 
by calling on people around the world to observe a meatless Monday. Pledge dot meatfree Mondays or one word dot com. And for yeah. meat loyalists, there is now something called cellular agriculture. Which is faster than a cow. Meat is grown in a lab instead of inside an animal. It's called clean meat. Another growing alternative to the local butcher. Along with berries, more than meat, sausage rolls. I'm Dana Lewis, reporting for Insight. Well, let's talk about that some more. I'm joined in the studio by Carol Dalin. She's a senior research fellow for the Institute of Sustainable Resources at the University College London. Also with us is Ludvi Radwan. He's a former rural development consultant and now lives as a farmer at Willowbrook Farm in Oxfordshire. Um, Carol, how acute is this problem? How soon do we have to start changing our diet? I would say we have to change it, uh, start changing it now. Um, because uh, we are living in a limited planet with limited resources, limited water available and land. And we know that livestock production has a high impact on mm. uh, the environment, also through emissions of greenhouse gases that warm up the climate. So given the population is growing and eating more and more meat, we have to try and, and control this growth and make meat production more sustainable at the same time. And we have to share what we can produce around a greater and greater population around the, around the planet, you would say. Exactly. Would exactly. There will be about 2 billion more people between now and 2050, and the planet's resources are not growing in the meantime, so it's a challenge. <laughs> Um, but rather, the, the um, meat consumption is geographically has trends to it, doesn't it? I mean, more meat consumption in the West, other countries prefer or tend towards a more vegetarian diet already. Can't we just re keep that balance going? Uh, well, I think that's the crux of the problem. It's, it's not necessarily even an issue of production, but it's, it's a, an issue of, of consumption patterns. Uh, changes wouldn't necessarily be necessary in food production. I mean, we're, we're being told by FAO that we need to increase food production probably by 50 percent uh, by 2050. Yes. But if that's given the current consumption patterns. And there are a lot of questions to be asked about consumption patterns in the West, um, levels of waste in food production. And it's really probably more correct to frame this as a question of inequality and access to those resources rather than actually just a, a sheer lack of the food resource. Uh, because we don't have the resources really to redistribute all this stuff anyway, do we? I mean, there aren't the global patterns of actually, if you produce meat or meat products or you can rear animals in one part of the world, you've then got to ship all these products around the world to other parts where they're consumed. That in itself is an inefficient process, surely. But that's the process we currently have. Yes. I mean, most of the food that's coming into the Western developed economies, a lot of it is being produced in the less developed economies and being shipped over to us for consumption. And it's taking away valuable land for production of uh, food in those countries. And it's interesting to learn, Carol, how inefficient um, an animal is in terms of calories in it consumes mm -hmm. versus the amount of calories we can enjoy by eating it. Sounds a bit brutal, but that's kind of thing what we do, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So when we eat a calorie of meat, uh, especially beef, which is the most inefficient at converting the feed that it eats into the calories in meat form, uh, in one calorie that we eat, there was 10 calories eaten by the animal originally, so there's only a 10% efficiency there. 10 calories, and when you scale up the amount of water the animal needs to drink as well yeah. as part of that process. Yeah, so the largest amount of water is actually uh, the water that was used to irrigate the crops that the animals is eating, uh, because they live actually quite long lifetime, so they eat a lot of those calories and that requires water and land. Um, and in terms of trade that you were mentioning before, the China is a good example because it's been growing so fast in the last uh, few years in terms of population and, and economic growth. Um, they've imported a lot of soybeans from Brazil to feed the pork because they have a high um, demand from, for pork. Right, so the logic that if this was an industrial process, you'd say this is madness, you know, all this energy going in, all these things in here, turning it into something which then gets eaten <coughs> over here. But can you get, is it possible to use the um, crops that are used to feed animals at the moment for humans? Can you just 
cut the, the animal out, if you like, I and go straight by, by from some one estimates, to the other. around 50% of all crops produced are diverted to animal and livestock feeds. 50%. 50% of right. food that's produced. So if you change that by just a small amount, that would make a big difference, wouldn't it? Yes, and then of course for each animal that wasn't uh, that where the crops are diverted to a vegetarian diet, you'd actually have 10 times more food available technically, in that you only need. Uh, a smaller amount of protein if it's consumed mm. directly than you would if it's converted through an animal into protein. So how is this to be managed, would you say, as a farmer? Is it the fact that we just keep on going blind to this problem for as long as we can, paying probably more and more for this increasingly rare food stuff? Or is it a matter, as our film suggested, that we need to start bringing this conversation to the fore now and maybe asking people not to eat meat two, three, four times a week Absolutely. so that they change yeah. their diet gently? Uh, I think everyone is, is talking about a crisis with in the next 30, 40, 50 years. It's that seems be, a long way off, though, doesn't uh, it? Well, not necessarily, not if, not if you're uh, maybe not as old as us two. But uh, <laughs> I think for most people, that's, you know, the foreseeable <coughs> future. And when we're talking about a crisis, we're talking about increased incidences of famine. I, I was listening to Radio 4 this mo morning, and three countries were declared in a serious state of famine where they're actually surviving now on roots and leaves. Uh, South Sudan was one, the Yemen is another. Um, and that's increasingly happening around the world. That's producing migration patterns, which we're all experiencing and, and witnessing here from the West, in Europe particularly. So th that sort of social dislocation yeah. is actually starting now, and it's reaching a, a crisis point over that next 30 years. So, Carol, what are the alternatives? Talk us through some of the things. If I'm not going to eat beef products or uh, any animal products, let's take chickens out the loop as well and lamb, what are the other things that I could do to get my protein? So, as you know, a lot of people have, and cultures have been vegetarians for, for hundreds of, of years, and they are perfectly healthy. So there is not uh, such a thing as we have to eat meat to get protein. Um, there is protein in uh, pulses in particular. They're really high in protein, so vegetable protein. Um, and then, as we've seen in the, in the film, if you can't really not eat any meat, I would say just eat a bit less, less often. Yes. And more, you know, chicken rather than beef. And then if, you know, the, this lab meat uh, comes to something realistic, you can try that. Well, I was going to ask you about it. It's completely artificial meat. I mean, have you experienced that? Have you I ever know, had a chance I to taste it? I haven't personally. I mean, ob obviously, as a, as a sort of consumer prospect, it doesn't sound very appealing, mm. does it, really? It's a lump of plastic, essentially. Well, I hope it's not plastic. <laughs> well, I, I, I use shorthand, but you know what I mean. It doesn't, it doesn't sound very appealing. Right. Yeah. So I would say maybe the more realistic um, balance between zero meat and uh, this lab meat would be just eat it less frequently, go to poultry rather than beef in particular. Mm -hmm. That would be a bit, maybe... The a poultry food chain, is that more sustainable? Is that more affordable for the time being? Um, a sustainable mixed farming system is in fact quite a positive element because there's a lot of recycling of the animal waste within the farm, the manures, the fertilizers are produced directly from the animal waste and then incorporated back into the soil which can then grow and produce the feed for that. So a mixed farming system, uh, certainly on a small scale, is something that's quite positive in farming and certainly in managing the environment. It's when you look at the factory farming systems where there's a gross imbalance and you're producing a large amount of of meat for urban demands across the globe. Um, and the waste products from that are actually directly polluting water courses, polluting air quality, okay. um, and issues of animal welfare, of course, need to be brought in. So I don't think it's just a simple zero-sum game of, of vegetarianism against meat consumption, but some form of balanced meat consumption, and certainly reducing the quantity of meat. And we were talking earlier about the whole issue of the pricing, because Currently, food production systems don't make the polluter pay. So there's a lot of environmental implications coming out of factory farming, which are actually going by the, by the side. No one's looking at them. It's artificially allowing meat to be produced very cheaply, and therefore it's very attractive to have three times a day. Um, yeah. We need to turn that around and actually look at the implications of food production. But, Carol, aren't there some things? I mean, we talk in particular, <coughs> I think, about iron, for instance, which is essential to a healthy diet. You get iron, don't you, from eating meat. So vegetarians have to compensate for that. Won't we all have to learn to compensate to, to achieve a chemical balance, an ideal chemical balance for our bodies? Yeah, you can, I think you can also get iron from vegetables like spinach, can't you? And, yeah, and it, it's but, much nicer eating a piece of steak, <laughs> believe you spinach. me. Well, maybe some people <laughs> would disagree with that, but uh, 
It's actually, it's also, if you bring up health, there is also some, you know, health consideration in the way we currently eat, in the, especially in the Western world, it, you know, too much fat, too much red yes. meat. Uh, so it would also reduce um, some diseases if we improve uh, the diet shifting from... What well, this whole discussion might play into the obesity discussion, that because exactly. we eat too much meat, we, yeah. we tend to get, become obese. Yeah, All actually, right. on, on that point, I mean, there's a, an interesting figure that there's approximately one billion people living below the poverty level, uh, a severely malnourished level. There's a further one billion that we could put into a, a malnourished level with vitamin and nutrient deficiencies. And there's a further one billion facing serious problems of obesity, overconsumption, yeah. and related uh, health issues to that. So it's really this question of inequality which I think is at the heart of the food issue. Okay. Ludvi, thank you very much indeed. And Carol, thank you for the moment. We're going to continue talking about food in part two. You're watching Insight and coming up, genetically modified food, the future of food production or a dangerous health